find out what else has happened that the Lord's done. <laughs> how incredible is that? What an awesome testimony. How, what a blessing. Keep praying. Keep praying. The Lord is good. Well, this morning we are going to uh, continue in our Bible study in Genesis chapter 42, looking at the life of Joseph. Uh, if you've been with us, you know we have been uh, going very steadily through the book of Genesis, and we're getting close to the end, surprisingly close. But this morning, uh, chapters 42 through 44, and then if you're reading ahead with us each week, you can be reading this week 45 through 47, okay? The reading for this week, 45 to 47. But we'll begin in 42 this morning. Now, where are we in the text? Uh, we've celebrated Easter and we've had guests, and so we, it's been a couple weeks since we've been here in Genesis. But remember now that Joseph is in Egypt. In chapter 41, uh, we read about his rise from prison, right? Miraculous rise out of prison and being uh, put second in command of the whole nation. And remember that the dreams that God gave uh, to Pharaoh, declaring that there would be a famine uh, throughout Egypt. There would be seven years of plenty and then uh, seven years of famine. And so Joseph has been put in charge of the nation to store up grain in preparation for this famine and then to disperse the grain when it's needed. Now, what we just read there in the previous chapter, in chapter 41, really is an incredible deliverance of Joseph from prison. He was put in prison wrongfully and then he's, uh, his innocence is recognized and, and God just moves in this miraculous way to deliver him from prison. Um, what we're going to read in the next three chapters is also a story of deliverance, except this is the deliverance really of Joseph's father, Jacob, and of his brothers, because they too are in a prison of sorts, okay? We're going to discover very early on in our text this morning that Jacob, though he is one of the patriarchs, though he has known the Lord his whole life, though he has walked with God, had his own experiences with God, yet here late in his life, uh, he is really a prisoner of his own sorrow and his own fear. In fact, he's nearly paralyzed by them. He's drowning in sorrow over the loss of his son Joseph. And he's incredibly paranoid. He's incredibly afraid uh, for his youngest son, Benjamin, this would be Joseph's only full brother, and he's afraid Benjamin will be lost. Uh, and then Joseph's other sons, they're not much better off, okay? They are also in a prison of sorts. They are uh, haunted by guilt over their betrayal of Joseph, over selling him into slavery, uh, over lying to their father about it and suggesting that he'd been killed, and they're haunted by this. And the most amazing thing is going to happen in these three chapters this morning, and that is that the Lord is going to take this family down a very difficult but a very necessary road, okay? They will be stressed. They will be stretched nearly to the breaking point. But God is going to do this for one very important purpose, and that is to set them free, to set Jacob free, from his sorrow and his fear, to set the brothers free from their guilt, and then ultimately to restore them in a right and a good relationship with Joseph. He's going to heal this family. Anybody relate to needing some healing in a family? I think we could all relate to that. And so I pray the Lord will speak to us uh, very distinctly this morning through these passages. Let's begin to read. Genesis 42, 57, the, the last verse of the previous chapter says, excuse me, 41, says this. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Now 42, verse 1. And when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look to one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. 
But Jacob did not send to Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest calamity should befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the famine, the first year of famine has come. It is extremely severe. It's affected not only Egypt, but the region surrounding, which includes Canaan, which is where Jacob and his sons are living. And, and he says to his sons, why, do you look, why are you standing around looking at each other? There's grain in Egypt. You need to go and buy us some grain. Here's something we need to recognize, and that is pressure. God sometimes uses pressure to move us and shape us and change us, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Here, the pressure comes because of an unavoidable circumstance, a famine. It's affected Canaan and Egypt, as we said, and Jacob and his family are in the middle of it. And things are dire. Note that he says, that we may live and not die. This is not an act of convenience. This is an act of desperation. Okay? But also notice in our text that Jacob has to say to his sons, why are you, why are you looking at each other? Why are you standing around? And the implication from the text is, and the language, is that uh, they're nervous about going to Egypt. Like, should we really go down there? And why are they perhaps nervous about going to Egypt? Because they know that's the most likely place that they could run into Joseph, that he's probably a slave in Egypt. But also note, as we mentioned earlier, the fear in Jacob. He's not going to send all of his sons. He's holding one back, the youngest one, Benjamin. And he's not holding him back because he's a little kid. We know from the timeline, Benjamin's at least 20 years old, probably older at this point. But he's desperately holding on to him. I want to give you a quote from the prophet Tony Robbins. He says, change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And others have said similar things. But this is truth. This, because this is our human nature. This is our sinful nature. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. As humans, we can be incredibly stubborn, but God knows what it takes to move us, and he loves us enough to orchestrate things, even sometimes very difficult things, so that we will change, and that we will turn, and we will start to walk in his direction and move in his direction. That's what's happening here. Look at verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. Do we remember those dreams a few chapters ago? Joseph, when he's young, has this dream that they're all out in the field and, and they're, um, they're bound, uh, sheaves of wheat bow down to his. And then he has another dream where the sun and the, the moon and the stars all bow down. And, and the idea is, one day you guys are going to bow down to me. And then in this moment, when the brothers come to buy grain and, Jesus, and Joseph is over the land of Egypt, this, this dream is fulfilled, this promise of God, this prophecy of God through the dream. And, and what was it like for Joseph in that moment to, to remember that and to recognize that, wow, this is happening. This is happening. What God promised him and what God spoke to him must have just come flooding into his mind. But the context, the circumstances in which God fulfilled that promise had to be radically different than Joseph ever would have imagined them. I, I, we don't know what Joseph thought about those dreams, but I can imagine that when he's a young man and, 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 and God gives this word that his family is going to bow down to him, you know, he probably thought of uh, uh, maybe envisioning running the family farm or owning a great amount of land in Canaan and, and, and being sort of the, uh, the de facto patriarch in the family, though he wasn't even the firstborn. There's no way he could have imagined that God would fulfill that word in this way. 
And I can sympathize with that because whatever promises God gives me or words I think that he shares with me, I always imagine them working out one way and it's always different. So I should probably give up on trying to figure out what God's going to do. But God is faithful to his word. And so let's finish the verse. Joseph remembered the dreams when he dreamed about them, and he said to them, now listen to this, Joseph says, you are spies, and you have come to see the nakedness of the land, or the weaknesses of the land. So Joseph's first reaction is to be harsh with them. He calls them spies, accuses them of coming to seek out Egypt's uh, weaknesses in the time of famine. And, And Joseph, now he's not doing this out of anger, as we'll see, he's doing this to be clever. Verse 10, and they said to him, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. I wonder if Joseph nearly choked when they said, we are honest men. Verse 12, but he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying you are spies. Now we're going to find out further into the passage that Joseph is accusing them of being spies so that he can interrogate them and ask them a bunch of personal questions. He he wants to find out um, about his father. He wants to find out about Benjamin. And and the only way to ask these questions without raising suspicions is to accuse them of being spies and then interrogate what their circumstance really is about. He really wants to know, are his brothers still scoundrels? Have they done to Benjamin what they did to him? Look at verse 15. He says this, he says, In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison three days. So he puts them in prison, he's going to let them think things over, see how they're going to react. Verse 18, Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, there's that phrase again. If you are honest men, we're going to see this this phrase pop up again and again in our story. And this is really um, the crux of the issue. This is their claim. We are honest men. And like I said, Joseph is going to find out if they really are honest men. But more than that, And we might say in the story more accurately and more importantly, God is going to use Joseph and these circumstances to bring about their honesty. God is going to be applying pressure to them so that they come to a place of surrender and they come to be actually the honest men that they claim. You know, there's a lot of things that we believe about ourselves that just aren't really true. And that's hard to hear, but it's, it's the quality of our human nature, especially in sin. Sin is deceitful. And it's easy to see sin in others, and, and, and sometimes we simply refuse to see sin in ourselves. And, and, and this is one of, the, one of the things, one of the results, one of the good works that God does sometimes through hard circumstances and through pressure is is we come to a place where we honestly see ourselves. And this is what's going to happen to Joseph's brothers. He says this, he says, If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain from the famine to your houses. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. So Joseph says, okay, I'm not going to keep all of you and send one. I'll just keep one and send the rest and bring Benjamin back. Verse 21, and then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, remember, he's the oldest. 
He said, did I, did I not speak to you, saying, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. So the brothers get a little taste of what Joseph had experienced, and immediately the guilt of their betrayal from 22 years before overwhelms them. Why is this happening to us, they ask. And then they can only answer, because we deserve it. A commentator I enjoy, David Guzik, he says this, a guilty conscience sees every trouble as sin's penalty. Proverbs says, the guilty flee when no man pursues. The guilt is, is a cancer. Reuben throws in a, I told you so, we shouldn't have done this. But they are all guilty, and they feel it. And Joseph hears this conversation, of course, and now it's going to overwhelm him. Look at verse 24. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Simeon is the secondborn. Perhaps Joseph, understanding that Reuben had tried to free him, and we know Simeon's past character as a cruel man. Perhaps that's why he chose Simeon, but, but he binds Simeon and keeps him. And then Joseph gave a command, verse 25, to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Now this is incredible. Joseph sending them back, he sells them the grain, air quotes, pastor air quotes. He sells them the grain, but he secretly returns each man's money back into, the, back into their sack. So he essentially gives them the grain. And then he also blesses them, gives them provisions for their journey in addition to the grain, what they're going to need for the trip. Thus he did for them. I have that one underlined. This, to me, is amazing grace. And I believe it's a picture of what the Lord does for us. Even though Joseph is putting them through the ringer, he's still providing for them. You see, he's not being cruel. He's being led by the Spirit. He's being led by God for a righteous purpose. But in this process, when they're in their difficulty, he's still providing for them. He's actually blessing them giving them the grain, returning the money, giving the provisions. This is a reflection of the character of Jesus. It's a reflection of God's grace and the kind of grace that we all experience. You know, I don't know about you, but I can look back on hard trials and hard circumstances and see, wow, even in that, God was providing for me and he was providing for my family. And he was taking care of us. I was coming apart at the seams because of my circumstances, but he was really holding everything together. I didn't feel it, but when I look back, I have to recognize, wow, thus he did for me. You know, when the Israelites are going to wander around in the desert for 40 years because of their unbelief, guess what? God's going to feed them every day with manna. And the scripture says he kept their clothes and their shoes from wearing out for 40 years. I got to go to shoe station like twice a year. <laughs> 40 years, their sandals never wore out. A hard trial to create in the nation a character of faith, a necessary thing before they go into the promised land. And yet even in their difficulty, see God is thus doing for them and providing for them. And he does the same for us. God is faithful and he is good even when we're stubborn and stuck in our sin. Look at verse 26. So they loaded their donkeys with grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money and there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored and there it is in my sack. And then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? You see, they know. Their hearts are so guilty 
over Joseph that when they see this money, they know they're going to be accused of stealing it. That's exactly where their mind goes. We're going to be accused of stealing it, and, and now we've gone from bad to worse. Proverbs 28, 13, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Secret sin is a terrible curse. But he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. They're, they're dying from this guilt. Their conscience was under such great bondage that they even regarded something good as punishment from God. Again, quoting Pastor Guzik, a guilty conscience doesn't even know how to handle gifts from the Lord. Verse 29, then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan and told him all that had happened to them, saying, the man who is Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father, one is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your household and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened, as they emptied their sacks, that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they, when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. See, Joseph, as we mentioned, he wants to be sure that Benjamin is alive and well, and they've not mistreated him. And I think he wants to know if the brothers will come back for Simeon, right? Or will they just forsake him to save their own necks? Their character is getting put to the test. And now by putting all the money back in their sacks, he's really putting them in a tough place because then they have to come back facing the accusation that they're thieves, even being wrongly accused even as Joseph had been. But Joseph, as I said, he's not doing this to be vindictive. He's being led by the Lord. Now, verse 36, And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, the oldest, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now we said in the beginning, Jacob is drowning in his sorrow. He's imprisoned by his fear. And we see it so clearly here. I mean, this whole exchange between Jacob and Reuben is just dripping with drama. Right? All things are against me, Jacob declares, willing to leave one son, Simeon, in prison so that he doesn't have to give up the other son. And then Reuben, frustrated and desperate, provides the most foolish, ridiculous idea. If I don't bring... If I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons in his place, right? Right? Nobody's thinking clearly. None of this makes sense. They're just awash in sorrow and in fear and in desperation. And, and Jacob is not really acting like a man of faith, right? The sons are imprisoned in their guilt, and Jacob is imprisoned in his sorrow, and all he can see is that all things are against him. He says there at the end in verse 38, if Benjamin dies, I'll die from grief. Christians, hear this. We have to believe the promises of God, especially in times of loss especially in times of sorrow. We cannot allow ourselves to drown in our grief. You know, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, 
He said, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, believers that had already died. There was a teaching out there that, that they had missed the resurrection and, and they were lost forever. He says, he says I don't want you to, to, to be ignorant that, you know, they're okay. They're with the Lord. The resurrection hasn't come yet. But he says, for this reason, he says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For believers, we sorrow. We sorrow. We have grief. We mourn. But there's a distinct difference. Because in our sorrow and in our grief and our mourning, especially over those who are lost, right? Who are lost, who we feel are lost to us from death. They're not really lost. See, we sorrow with hope. That is, with the certainty that we will be reunited again. Right? We can't be like Jacob and allow ourselves to, to drown in these emotions. Look, for us, for believers, for those who know God, life is not the end. This life is not, it's barely the beginning. It is barely the beginning. All right, and so we should not cling to it so desperately. Jacob could have looked at his grandfather, Abraham. Abraham had a, had a godly perspective, a perspective of faith. When faced with the judgment of Sodom and the possible loss of his nephew Lot, Abraham says this. He says, this is Genesis 18, 25. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham knew he wasn't in control. But his declaration of faith is, I know that God is going to do what is right. And I can trust him to be good. He's not going to be vindictive. He's not going to, he's going to, not going to do something cruel out of malice. God is going to do what is right. And Abraham declared his faith in that way. And we have to declare the same thing. I don't understand my circumstances. And I don't understand my loss. And I don't understand the grief. But I know who God is. And I know he is good. And I know he does what's right. We have that to hang on to as believers. That is our hope. The knowledge of the character and the goodness of God. But we also have more than that. Because Jesus says in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. We have the peace of Jesus. Things that when we don't feel them, we can pray for them and call out to the Lord in faith, knowing, Lord, this is your word. And this is your promise. And you're going to get me through. Right? This is not worldly peace, Jesus says. This is my peace. It's not based on your circumstances. It's what I provide to you. It's because of who I am. Listen, whatever is wrong, he can fix. Whatever hurts, he can heal. Whatever is lost, he can restore. Whatever we cannot understand, he does understand. And we can trust him with it. Our role when we're in Jacob's place is to call out to Jesus and to receive from him and to believe his word. I love what G. Campbell Morgan says. He said, it is never wise to measure the fact of any hour by the limit of our own vision. It is never wise to measure the fact of any hour by the limit of our own vision. Jacob had no idea. He had no idea that Joseph was alive and that the things that are happening to him and to his family, it's God at work to bring about not just a reunion, but a restoration. He just couldn't see it. Listen, God still works all things together for good. Amen. All right, chapter 43. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down, 
For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? And then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and our, also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let, him, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now he would have returned this second time. Listen, when we do not want to act, God is patient. And the truth is we're not going to outweigh the eternal one. He knows, though, how to apply pressure over time. And now the famine is getting more severe and the food is used up. And so they must face this issue again. And it's interesting that now Judah is the one, the fourth born. Judah is the one who steps up to speak to his father. Remember back in 37 that Judah was the one that suggested in the first place that Joseph be sold. But now here, he's going to take responsibility for Benjamin. And he steps up and pleads with his father. Look at verse 11. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise and go back to the man and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your own brother and Benjamin or your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So Jacob now is at the end, his end. He can't watch his family starve and God has brought Jacob to this place where he must face his fear. Remember Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain in obedience to God. And when he goes to sacrifice Isaac, the book of Hebrews tells us that he believed that if necessary, God would raise Isaac from the dead, but that God was going to be faithful to his promises. Abraham believed in the resurrection. But he had to come to this place where he was willing to surrender that which was most valuable and important to him, that upon which all the promises of God hinged in his life. And Jacob is having to do this now. He's having to, to, to lay out, to offer up to the Lord, to, to release into God's care that which is most precious to him, which is his son Benjamin. He essentially says, well, you know, we can't do anything else, so I guess let's just trust God. May God Almighty be with you and give you favor. That's not a lot of faith, but at least it's in the right direction right? By God's grace, may we learn to trust him as our first response instead of as our last resort. And we could be harsh on Jacob and be critical of him, but I believe we could also all go around the room and be honest and say, I have been there and I have done that. And I have trusted God only as my last resort and not as my first response. But God is patient and he brings Jacob to this very needed place where he must give up what he's holding on to. And then Jacob, of course, says, hey, take the man a present. It's like with Esau, right? He's, he's, it's like the same old Jacob. He's trying to just, even, even in this, he's like, well, I'm gonna do whatever I can to try to control the other person and, and, and work things out for my good. He's, he's, the old Jacob is coming out here, but he does release him. Look at verse 15. So the men took that present in Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned to our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys." So they're still guilt-ridden. And now the money issue is just adding to that. 
and they believe they're going to be made slaves. Verse 19, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, oh, excuse me, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. So they're trying to get ahead of this thing and talk to the steward of the house and explain their situation. Verse 23, but he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. This really had to confuse the brothers. The steward says that the God of their father gave them their money back, and the steward said he had it all along. Obviously, Joseph is talking to his steward. The steward knows what to say. But the message to the brothers really is, look, your God is at work to bless you. Your God is at work to bless you, and I'm sure they did not understand it. Look at verse 24. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. And then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their house, in their hand, into the house, and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. We've said many times in our study of Joseph that he is given to us in Scripture as a foreshadowing, as a type of Christ, of Jesus. And Joseph's character and his circumstances are a reflection of Jesus. And we will discuss this more when we make it down to chapter 45 next week. But when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, it's an incredible picture there of the Lord. But we also get a picture of the Lord here. Notice that Joseph longed for his brother Benjamin, and he is overcome with emotion. There are times when we do not understand the trials that we're going through. Right? When, like Jacob, we say, everything is against me. But here we clearly see Joseph's heart toward his family. And I believe this is a reflection of the heart of Jesus toward us. See, this is how the Lord feels for us. He longs for relationship to be restored. He longs for us. He longs for fellowship. And make no mistake, it has nothing to do with who we are. It has everything to do with who he is. Remember that before he was crucified, Jesus, he rides into town on the donkey on what we call Palm Sunday. In Matthew 23, 37, this is the declaration of Jesus as he sees the city before him. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those are sent, who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, this is the pleading of the desire of the heart of God that we would be drawn to him, know him, restored in a relationship to him, have life with him. This is the heart of Joseph. Even when we are not longing for him, he is longing for us. God will use what he needs to use to bring us before him. Here, God uses their guilt and their fear and their desperate need to bring them into the presence of Joseph. If it's necessary, and we need to see all those things. We need to see, each of us needs to see before Jesus that we have a desperate need for him, that we are guilty before him. 
that we fear the judgment to come. We must recognize these things. We must humble ourselves before Jesus, just as the brothers do before Joseph. But we also discover in that the longing and the loving heart of God toward us. Again, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Look at verse 31, speaking of Joseph. He washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. And so they set him a place by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. So this incredibly segregated society, even though Joseph is the ruler. Verse 33, and they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. I think Joseph's now, he's just messing with them. Oldest to youngest, he sits them down in order. Verse 34, then he took servings to them from before him, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. Maybe he wanted to see if they'd become jealous of Benjamin like they'd been jealous of him. But there isn't any indication in the text. They just were relieved at this moment, and they, and they, they ate together. Now look at chapter 44 to finish. Now he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill them in sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Joseph setting them up again, planting this valuable cup in Benjamin's sack. Verse three, as soon as the morning dawned, the men went their way, they and their donkeys. And when they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks? And with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. And so Joseph, still playing the role of the Egyptian ruler, suggesting that this is his seance cup, which it's not, of course. But he, this accusation goes out against the brothers. And they said to him, verse 7, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. So the brothers are flabbergasted that this has happened, that this accusation has been made. And they are so sure of their innocence that they say, whoever you find, you can kill, and we'll be your slaves. And then the steward says, okay, whoever I find it with, he modifies the deal. Whoever I find it with, he'll come be my slave, and the rest of you can go. See, they protest their innocence, and they are innocent in one sense, because they're innocent of the cup. But you know, in another sense, they're still guilty, right? They're guilty of their past sin, and they are not quite yet honest men. It's been said that trying to outrun sin is like trying to outrun your shadow. You simply can't do it. You know the only way to get rid of a shadow? You stand in the light. And who is the light? Jesus. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack so he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Now listen, this is the first step of real repentance. By their agreement with the steward, only the one who had the cup had to go back. But they all return. They cannot let Benjamin take the fall and save themselves. They can't do to Benjamin and they can't do what they had done to Joseph. And they can't do this again to their father. So all 11 of them return. You know, the idea of repentance, the biblical idea of repentance is change. Repentance means turning, changing, changing your mind, turning your, your perspective, changing your actions, doing something 
different, doing something new, doing what is right. And they literally turn around and go back to Egypt. The first step of repentance is not running away. It's not hiding. It's to show up and to face your sin and your consequences. Verse 14, so Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? And then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? Judah now, speaking up for the group. What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do this. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. And so Joseph tests them again and offers them a way out. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? Listen so carefully to these words. This is one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture. He says, And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with, if our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. This is the second step of repentance that we see in the brothers. They were taking ownership. Judah does not necessarily confess to the issue of betraying Joseph because that's not the issue at hand. He does acknowledge it. But he does here take ownership for Benjamin. He says, I made a promise and I cannot betray the promise that I made to my father. That is the statement of an honest man. Verse 33. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? And this is the final step of repentance for the brothers. Judah pleads to take Benjamin's place, offering himself as a slave. He's offering restitution. He's doing whatever is in his power to make things right. And in this case, he offers his own life and his own service. That's real repentance. Jesus, of course, says in John 15, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Judah offers himself in place of his brother. You know, the brothers, and especially Judah, had hated Joseph and despised him and despised their father. And now they're pleading for Benjamin and they're doing it for the sake of, of their father. This is a radical transformation, an absolute 180 degree change. This is how we are called to repent, to stop running, to take ownership, and the best of our ability to do what is right. 
Now listen, we can't make restitution for our sin before God. Because if we did, we would die eternally. Only Jesus can pay the price for our sin. Only he makes restitution for our sin before God. We get to accept that gift of life and grace by faith. But we're also called to repentance, to change our direction, to follow him, and to serve him. And it's amazing to me, Judah, this is what he does. He lays down his life in service to Joseph. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul writes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. See, repentance is really death to self, but then the life of Christ is made real in us. And the life we now live, as Paul says, is the, is the life of Jesus. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Judah makes this plea. Now, this is a Hollywood-worthy cliffhanger for us because we're not coming back till next week to chapter 45, but it's awesome. So if you want to read ahead, you're free to do so. Listen, these are three very tense chapters. Jacob is distraught and full of fear. The brothers are distraught and racked with guilt. They have all traveled a very hard road together in these three chapters. Jacob pushed to the, to, to the brink. If I die, I die, he says, basically. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Barely a hint of faith in God. The brothers, overwhelmed with guilt, running and in fear at every turn, coming to a place, though, where they forsake their malice and they forsake their lies and they truly begin to act and become honest men. Next week, what celebration, what joy. What wholeness, what life. But it took this journey to bring them to this place. So my prayer today is that God's word has illuminated for us some very important things. That maybe he's given us some insight to see that our circumstances and the pressures that he allows and the pressures that he brings are to conform us into the image of Christ that we can trust his goodness, that he is faithful, that he cares for us even in the process, but his goal is to bring us to himself. And his goal is our transformation and our redemption. And our job is simply to trust him and to surrender to him, to lay down our lives so that it's then his life in us and his life through us. And that's where real peace is, and that's where real joy is. Let's pray. Beth, would you come up? Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you that you are sovereign, and you are wise, and you are good. And Father, I pray, God, if anybody, Lord, is in a moment in their life where they need your grace, God, where their circumstances are overwhelming, where you've been at work to draw them to yourself. Father, we pray for your results. We pray for soft hearts. We pray for surrender. Father, we ask that grace for all of us in this room, for we all need it. Lord, daily to go your direction and to surrender ourselves to you. Lord, thank you for your goodness. We just ask that you would bless your people today. You would bless us as we go out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and finish with a, a chorus.